Candidates have agreed to the rules and will be introduced based on the order they appear on the ballot. Uh, by coin toss, the Republican Party candidates appear on the ballot first this year. So, just to read the names, um, as they would be, um, first would be Republican Party Barbara Comstack. She is not appearing and did not send a representative. Democratic Party John Faust uh, was, uh, is not appearing and did not send a representative. So we now welcome Libertarian Party candidate Bill Redpath for his statement. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Bill Redpath. I'm the Libertarian candidate for U.S. House of Representatives in the 10th Congressional District in Virginia this year. A little bit about me. First of all, I am a 29-year resident of Virginia. I have a bachelor's degree from Indiana University and an MBA from the University of Chicago. Uh, out in my non-political life, I am a business appraiser specializing in media and telecommunications. I'm a licensed certified public accountant in Virginia. I'm also a chartered financial analyst and I have business valuation designations from the American Society of Appraisers and the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. I've been a candidate, geez, this is my sixth run, I believe, uh, as a uh, candidate here in Virginia. Uh, in 2001, just I'll name just three of them, in 2001 I was the Libertarian candidate for governor, in 2008 for U.S. Senate, in 2010 I ran for the same office uh, four years ago as the Libertarian candidate for U.S. House in the 10th District in Virginia. I want to thank the League of Women Voters and AARP and all of the sponsors of this event for including me, including Diane Blay and Brad Eicholt. Unfortunately, there are other organizations that have excluded us from debates in forums this year, including the Fairfax County Chamber of Commerce and the Loudoun County Chamber of Commerce uh, four weeks ago and one week ago today. And that's too bad. Of course, I feel uh, exceptionally sad that I was excluded because the Libertarian Party is a political party on the move. To tell you a little bit about how the Libertarian Party is advancing in this nation, in six of the last seven U.S. House elections, uh, the Libertarian Party candidates across the nation have earned over one million votes for U.S. House. The last time that happened before this six out of seven streak was in 1912, that any third party got over one million votes for U.S. House of Representatives. Also, in the entire history of this nation, uh, no political party other than the Democratic and Republican parties have ever earned more than one and a half million votes for top of the ticket in a midterm election. What does, mid, uh, what does top of the ticket mean? It means governor, if there's a governor's election. If not, then there's, it's U.S. Senate. Uh, there are five states that have neither a governor's election nor a U.S. Senate election this year. It's something else in those states. It's U.S. House in Washington State. It's Secretary of State in Indiana. In the District of Columbia, it's mayor. And this year it appears that the Libertarian Party will earn not just over one and a half million, but over two million votes in top ticket races coast to coast uh, just five weeks from now. And that will be a record for any party other than the R's and D's in a midterm election. We'll get into the substance of libertarian positions and my positions during the Q&A, but thank you for coming out on this evening and to listen to us and for your uh, kind attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Independent Green candidate Diane Blay. Hi, yes, I'm Diane Blay of the Independent Green Party. And um, this format where we have three minutes to present why we're running and who we are, it's, it's hard to fit everything in three minutes, but there are a fair number, um, a fair amount of time for questions and answers afterwards. So I thought that I would present to you some questions you could ask me. And so the fir first three would be, you marched against the war in Iraq and are adamantly opposed to airstrikes and killer drones in the Middle East, why? You've had health coverage all your life, so why is single-payer health care for all so important to you? You've seen many changes environmentally since you organized your high school's um, Earth Day activities in 1970. What do you want done for the environment now? So these three questions are the major, cover the major areas in which I want change, but there are many other things that need to be changed. A question to me about the changes in the electoral system might be, why are you for 
uh, proportional representation, term limits, and full public financing for national, state, and local elections? And why are you against corporate donations for campaigns and gerrymandering? So these answers can be found on the, on the Green Party's website, which is gp.org. And I think it's, they've, it's written up very well there. But um, another question for me might be, why are you such a huge fan of Ralph Nader, who was the first Green Party candidate for president and is still going strong at the age of 80, having just published his 16th book? And finally, there are other independent Green candidates running for Congress in Virginia. And you can go to the website votejoinrun.us. So my oldest son, Gerard Clarence Blay III, who is running for Congress in the 8th District, which is currently represented by Jim Moran, states uh, in one of the numerous questionnaires sent to congressional candidates that he is running to end wars of choice and aggression abroad, end the drug war in America via legalization of all drugs, eliminate taxes on the first $100,000 of income, fight for marriage equality, establish free single-payer universal health care, and expand public transportation, especially trains. The Hildebrands are a couple running in the 5th and 6th Congressional District, and they want to decrease the stress of citizens by getting back to livable wages and ending the drug war. They want legalization of industrial hemp. Gail Parker, known as Gail Farrell, is running in the 1st Congressional District. A question to us might be, why do you all bother to run when there is almost no chance you can win in this two-party, winner-take-all system? I'm looking forward to your questions. And then, Independent Brad Eichel. Good evening. Thank you, everyone. I want to first thank all the co-sponsors for hosting this event and then allowing us to speak. Um, I used my time at previous events to talk about, one, why I'm running, and then at the last event I discussed a few issues that I think are critically important for Congress to get passed right now. So you can check out the videos uh, through our Facebook page. You can find them, I Cold for Congress. And But today I want to answer one of the questions I get asked the most, which is why am I running as an independent? I get asked that all the time. People say, why don't you just pick one of the two parties and try to you know, fix things from within? Because clearly I think the system is broken. But I think I don't want to run as a Republican or Democrat because the two parties have been taken over by the extremes in Congress. And one of the main reasons for that is gerrymandering, the act of the state legislatures carving up the congressional districts in order to keep incumbents in power. It happened in this district just in 2010. The 10th district was starting to get middle of the road. It was of about 52, 48 Republican. So they carved out a bunch of Democrats into the 8th and the 11th districts, which are already heavily Democratic, so that they could try to keep this district in Republican hands. I think that is a shame, and if Barbara Comstock were here, maybe she could tell us a little bit about the process since she voted for it, but clearly she's not. She's just trying to ride that into victory, so now it's a, about 56% Repu Republican. Well, it's not going to work this time, because this time we have a candidate who repre represents the views of the moderate people. Okay, so I know that you all being here, you're here, you're watching the video at home, then I'm sure that you all are very likely to vote. And I'm afraid to say that's not going to be enough this time. We need to get to those people out there who don't vote, the 50% of people who didn't vote in the last non-presidential election in this district. You got to call your brother, you got to call your sister, your neighbor, you got to tell them that we got our guy this time, that there's somebody out there who represents our views and we need to get you out to the polls. You got it. You got to tell them that the movement has begun, that now the moderates are going to take over the House of Representatives and it starts right here today in this district. So you got to go on November 4th, go pick up your mom and drive her to the polls. We need everybody out there. We got to do it, and we got to do it this time. This is when we start. I need you all to be independent. Thank you very much. Thank all the candidates. Please, a round of applause for everybody, please. Okay. Let me um, first go to some. 
questions that have been written out by folks here. Um, start with. Um, first question would be: As you support, do you support repeal or replace the Affordable Care Act, or would you support amendments to the Act? If so, and if not, why, uh, Mr. Redfield? Well, I would support amendments depending on what they are, but uh, I would certainly vote to repeal and replace. Uh, I think that uh, what we need is a more deregulated, less top-down, more consumer-driven health policy in this nation. And I think the best way to go with that is to, first of all, it's not just a federal problem, it's a state problem. In Texas, uh, there uh, is a problem getting uh, medical care to the poor simply because of Texas law. Texas law requires doctors to be involved in many more procedures, medical procedures, than is the case in other states. And in the rural areas of Texas, where there are fewer doctors, that leads to a problem. We could have an LPN, you could have others do certain medical procedures there, but it's not allowed under Texas law. So it needs to be an effort uh, it, with of the federal government in conjunction with states, but I think it would be far superior to have a system where there would be a refundable uh, tax credit, income tax credit, uh, that would be paid to everyone, uh, and being refundable, it could be then paid to people who were not otherwise paying income tax, as long as that uh, money is spent on health insurance. They would have to prove that the money was spent on health insurance, uh, but I think this would uh, allow uh, greater freedom. It would sever the link between employment and health insurance. We don't get our other insurance through our employer. It is an accident of World War II uh, and the wage freeze that occurred at that time, and co companies began competing on benefits, and it has finally come to this point. So I think that that is uh, the way to go uh, to allow greater freedom, much greater choice in policies, to allow health insurance to be purchased across state lines, and that's what I would do to replace uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act. Ms. Blay. Okay, well I certainly agree that where you work should not be a decision on to what kind of insurance you can get. but. As a Green Party candidate, we stress the uh, universal health care for all, and so that wouldn't be um, applicable, actually. But in the state of Virginia, when we uh, didn't, it didn't accept the Medicaid um, extension. That was that was, I think, a travesty for the, I guess, 400, almost 400,000 people who are not covered by health insurance now. So. Thank you. I think the continuous votes to re quote repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act are a complete waste of time and money. I think for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's never going to happen unless the Republicans somehow take over 60 seats in the Senate so they have a, a filibuster proof majority and the presidency, which could not happen any sooner than 2016 it's never going to be repealed. So if it has problems, then let's fix it. So sure, we can offer amendments and fix it. I don't know that Republicans are ever going to do that because why would we want to make this system better that they don't want at all? So I don't think it's going to happen. But for instance, Republicans have a problem with the, the parts of the bill that are under the minimum standard of care. So there are items within the minimum standard of care that they have a problem with. If that's the case, then let's have a debate on whether or not those things are needed within the minimum standard of care. And if not, then we can take them out. Just one example of many, it's not a perfect bill. It was passed by one of the worst Congresses in the history of the United States. So no, it's not a perfect bill. And it was rammed through with only votes of one party. So no, it's not perfect, but let's fix that fix the system we're in. It's starting to get more people health insurance, which was the goal. It's starting to bring down the cost of health coverage, which was the goal. So we're moving in the right direction. I say, let's fix what we have, and then we can move on from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next question is, what would you propose for assuring there is a reliable, safe source of energy and what measures would you support to enhance 
clean air. Miss Blake. Um, for energy, as well, the Green Party is against all um, the they're against the coal and oil, nuclear and gas. In that they. We, we know that we have this going on now, but we want totally renewable sources of energy. So we want to, um, this carbon in our atmosphere and the methane needs to be lowered tremendously. We're way past the 350 that we should be at. So we have to, the Green Party totally advocates major efforts on, on, on everyone's part to try to do what we can to clean up the air and the water. Mr. Eichold, you must have known him before. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I agree. We do need to move past. We need to move past oil. We need to move past coal. We need to move at, past all the carbon products because they are polluting our atmosphere and making the temperature increase. There's just no getting around the science on that. I think we need to look beyond the current forms of green energy that are currently out there because none of them are really scalable to the amount of energy that we're going to need in the future for global global demand. I know of a plan to build a new type of nuclear power plant that doesn't it's safe. It's it doesn't it doesn't pollute the atmosphere. It, do, it won't melt down, and it will actually, and it doesn't produce the type of of uh, radioactive waste of the of the current process. It creates a ball about the size of a grapefruit versus metric tons of waste that the current process does, and it and it can actually eat the 200 or 370 thousand metric tons of of nuclear waste that currently exists in the world. Uh, there was a, an interview on Fareed Zakaria on CNN, uh, and I, Leslie Dewan is the lady's name, so you can look her up and, and watch the interview. It was just fantastic. And, it, and beyond not creating new waste, it, it uses, a, it uses uh, frozen sodium or something along those lines, and it will actually eat the waste that exists. We have to do something like that. We need something big that is going to produce energy, and it's cost effective. They have brought it down to the price of coal right now, and they want to try to make it uh, meet the price of uh, natural gas. And they're working on that, and we need to do it here in the United States because I fear that China is going to be the first one to build a plant like this, and we need to be ahead of the curve. So that's where I would go with energy. Thank you. Mr. Redpin. Uh, I would urge a free market in energy. Uh, we're going to be using oil for a while yet in this nation. I think there's just no avoiding that. There are, There is not a, a, an economically feasible alternative to petroleum for so many things. Coal is suffering right now, not to gov not really, the government has something to do with it, but it's also in the marketplace right now where coal is uh, in decline and probably will continue in decline. Uh, natural gas development in this nation is uh, is is more economical, and that's one of the reasons that the coal, uh, the coal industry, particularly in Appalachia, you may have heard about the problems in Kentucky. Uh, it's really a marketplace phenomenon, and not something really driven by government uh, policy. Uh, with respect to uh, air quality, uh, air quality in this nation has improved from the time that uh, uh, I have uh, was a was a kid <laughs> over a generation ago, uh, but. Um, uh, but but so we've definitely experienced rising air quality in this nation. There is a role for government in regulating the commons, but there has to be a rigorous cost-benefit analysis uh, to adoption of, before there is adoption of further regulations uh, governing the environment. Thank you all very much. Um, I'll go with a short one for the moment. Um, there is a program called the Older Americans Act that has been in existence for almost 50 years. Some of you may know it as Meals on Wheels, uh, Senior Centers. Congress has failed to reauthorize and renew this program for the past four years. Um, would you commit to supporting a renewal of the Older Americans Act when you get to Congress? Mr. Eichel. I think you meant short because this is an easy one. Yes, absolutely. I, that 
makes no sense to me that we wouldn't reauthorize that. Um, if I had a choice, I'd spend more money feeding people. That, that there's nothing more important than feeding our people, especially our elderly people. So that seems like a pretty easy question to me. Thank you. I think it's an easy answer too. The answer is no. Uh, I'm all against hunger. Believe me, I don't want anybody to be hungry in this nation. It is a travesty. If anybody in this nation is hungry, I will grant you that. But we are facing a terrible fiscal crisis in this nation right now. And this is something that would be better handled by state and local governments than by the federal government. There are all sorts. There are scores of federal anti-poverty programs uh, that have existed for a long time over the last 50 years. Uh, the, the war on poverty has unfortunately not been a success as waged by the federal government over the past half century. Uh, this, I, I am for programs like this, but they ought to be handled at the state and local government level and by private organizations, even when the economy is doing reasonably well. It's not doing great. It's not doing badly. It's reason of doing reasonably well right now. We are still running federal budget deficits of a half trillion dollars a year. And, and it's not projected to go down, and it's projected to go back up starting at about 2018, according to the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, we have to monitor federal expenditures very carefully, and some things the federal government needs to pass on. This is one of them. It should be the responsibility of state and local governments, private institutions, and private individuals. And play. Okay, I, I thought there was still um, Meals on Wheels going on. I, I'm pretty sure I saw it in the newspaper. But anyway, we need to... Um, of course, I think it's a great thing, and we, we should be having it. Um, so, um, and as far as just being on the state and local level, I, it is handled locally. I know that. So the federal money could be brought down, and some not everyone, not every locality can afford it. So again, this is a way to to even it out the playing fields, where especially where some areas may not be able to afford it at all, that they could have it. So definitely in favor. Thank you. Um, before I go to another card, is there anybody who has a preference in stating their question orally? All right. Yes. Um, I think we have to get you a microphone, though, right? Jim? Thank you. And again, we're going to follow the same rules. Brief question and one question. Thank you. Uh, when should the U.S. put feet on the ground in other countries? What battles have, have to be fought? Well, certainly not against ISIS, I'll tell you that. I mean, it, it, first of all, the Congress needs to take back the war power. They are all, I mean, th 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 they went on recess. Yeah, I know it's an important campaign. I realize that. But, but they left town and didn't deal with the question of war, which is the most important question the Congress has to face. Uh, so uh, only in a case where... Uh, there is a it is, there is war declared by Congress, and or only in a case to to uh, prevent an imminent attack or respond or respond to an attack uh, that, that where where there has to be um, a quick action without uh, Congress's approval. If it, they can't wait for that, but in terms of troops, I just can't imagine. Frankly, I can't imagine the situation. Uh, given the logistics involved, uh, that uh, Congress would not be able to vote yay or nay before troops were deployed. You're all anticipating me here. Well, based, the Green Party is totally against most of this war that we we're just so warlike and so many things. We're going into all these countries where we have no business being in. We have we have um, different bases throughout the world, 150. But as for feet on the ground, I mean, we certainly don't want that unless it's absolutely necessary. And um, and I, the president might have an occasion where it's totally necessary somewhere, but it's certainly not the current situation in, in the Middle East. So um, we don't want that or, or the airstrikes or the killer drones. We don't want any of that stuff going on.
So we go from the easy question to the immensely difficult question. It, it is immensely difficult to decide when the United States should employ force overseas. And I think the president really, no one understands what it's like to put troops in harm's way than the 44 people who have served as president of the United States. So it's, it's hugely difficult to make that decision. Um, I will say that I think we do it too often. I think the war in Iraq was a mistake uh, because too often be violence begets violence. So us being there causes more problems than it fixes. And I, to a certain extent, I do believe that would be the case if we got involved with ISIS in that manner, if we actually had boots on the ground, so to speak. I can't stand that phrase. But if we actually had combat soldiers over there f trying to fight ISIS, I think that would cause more problems because it creates more, it creates more terrorists. They're fighting us because we are getting involved. And so we didn't get involved in Syria the first time for that reason, right? Why do we want to go in there and, and get our put our troops in harm's way only to have them now aiming at us and starting to hate us more. I think, I think it is too often a mistake. We have too often throughout history gone in and meddled in other countries to our own detriment later on. And so every situation is different. In this case against ISIS, I would likely not want to have combat troops in there. I would want to support the moderates in, in Kurdistan and if the Iraqi government is asking us to help out then I think we should help out but I think we should try to make the Agra Iraqi government be more inclusive and that w that w of, of Sunnis and that would help us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're going to switch to social security. Uh, do you support raising the earnings cap on Social Security contributions? Yes. I'd say yes. If I had a degree, I'd say no. <laughs> uh, yes, I do support raising the earnings cap. I, I think actually eliminating the cap. I think if we're going to collect a, a percentage of your income to go to Social Security, it should be a percentage of all your income. It shouldn't end at you know, some level above. I think we should means test Social Security. Yes, this is going to mean that rich people are going to pay more for people who don't have means. Well, welcome to America. I support a flat tax, so in, in the long run, I would think that my plans would lower their taxes, but in this case, yes, I would take away the earnings cap, I would means test it, and yes, thank you. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, it, I, it would do so little good. First of all, it would be the largest tax increase in the history of the United States to eliminate the cap. Number two, it only would buy us about eight extra years of Social Security solvency. That's all it would do. It would, be a, it would not be a permanent fix. It would be a very temporary fix. And, uh, and, and thirdly, I support the Cato Institute 6.2% plan. That is, that Social Security is one of the reasons I joined the Libertarian Party 30 years ago, because I realized it was a total ripoff of younger people in this nation. And that's exactly what it is, and that situation hasn't changed. Uh, and in fact, it's regressive because the poor tend to die earlier uh, so that they don't get their Social Security benefits. While there are plenty of people out there who are wealthy and live into their 80s and 90s and get Social Security benefits that they don't even really need. And so this 6.2% plan would protect people in the current system over the age of 55, allow people below that age to use their 6.2% Social Security tax to invest in private accounts in which they had personal property rights, which is not the case with Social Security. You do not have personal property rights in Social Security and to allow them then to, uh, the, the employer portion would still be paid for 6.2% would go into the social security system to pay for the current elderly's benefits. But I, I, I 
the one, one reason I'm running this year is the declining respect for the concept of economic freedom in the United States. The index of economic freedom, or excuse me, I take that back, economic freedom of the world is a study that is done year by year. In the year 2000, the United States ranked second behind only Hong Kong in terms of economic freedom of the world. It has now dropped to 17th. The scholars now rate the United States 17th among all the nations in terms of economic freedom, and it is falling fast, and, and this would only exacerbate the problem. Thank you very much. Let's now switch to education. We have had no child left behind, and now we're looking at the common core standards. What do you see as the role of the federal government in education and improving the quality of, it, of American education as especially compared to other nations? Michael. I don't think that, I don't think No Child Left Behind worked. I don't think the core standards work to a certain extent. I think it just tries to bring everybody to the middle so now we have a test and here's what you need to learn and this is all you get to learn at least in most instances across the country they there are it's not the case in in fairfax county or loudon county i'm sure where we have excellent school systems but you you create a test and people teach to the test i think the federal government should do a better job the Department of Education should find what works. They should be studying all of the different localities and the best way to get all of the students to learn better. And I think they should be going out to other localities where they aren't doing such a good job and trying to help implement those. I don't think a, I don't in this case think a top down government approach where you just say, do this and you come up with the funding and figure out how to do it is going to work. I think they need to take a more active role in trying to create better scenarios for every student because at the same time, I know what Bill's going to say, just to give you a preview, he wants to get rid of the Department of Education, but to me, <laughs> but to me that's saying if you're born in Alabama or Mississippi where the schools are terrible, then it's just too bad that you are not going to learn as well as somebody who was born in Fairfax County. I'm not going to give up on all of those students because they aren't doing a good enough job teaching their students. So we have to do better and and I think that's the way to go. I think that's where the Department of Education falls in. Thank you. Not that it was, not that it was set up this way, but Mr. Redpath. Studies have shown there is no link between education expenditures and educational achievement. Now, uh, and it's not the 1960s anymore. It's not the 1950s. Uh, I, I, yes, I don't think, first of all, it's not in the Constitution. Very important document. There is no role for the federal government in, in the Constitution. Above and beyond that, I think the states handled this problem, uh, this, this uh, uh, situation regarding education, uh, well overall and, uh, up until the 1970s when the Department of Education was founded. We are now spending, I think it's ballparkish, $80 billion a year with the Department of Education. And, and test scores in this nation, the needle really hasn't moved since the 1970s, after, after hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent on the Federal Department of Education. Uh, mankind advances through trial and error. And I think that this, uh, with 50 laboratories of democracy, 51 including the District of Columbia, more including the territories of the United States, we can leave it to the states, see what works, see what doesn't work, uh, and uh, through decentralization, uh, move this and hopefully school choice within the states, I think would be very important to create competition and innovation uh, in education. But I think the, uh, some sort of top-down approach like Common Core uh, from the federal government is something I completely disagree with. Well, I agree with Brad, and I think having basic I ideas of where we should be is, is a good idea. I, I think it's important that we, um, education is one of the most important things we can do, and, and I think that this, trying to get everyone to a certain level, it might be a minimum, it might, but it still is saying this is what we need. And of course, we always want to achieve more. So I, I think it's in favor of it.
<clears throat> would you introduce and try to garner support for a congressional bill that would require the states to have bipartisan commissions to perform the redistricting of congressional districts every 10 years? If not, why not? I'm sorry. The, I'm, I, pardon me. I want to make sure I understand the question. You would support congressional bill that would require? Uh, no, I don't think I would support that bill to be dictated from the federal government. The one thing the federal government should do, or the Congress should do, is to repeal the requirement uh, that Congress people be elected from single member districts. That didn't used to be the case, but there was a law that was passed, I think 1966 or 1967, that required uh, single member districts uh, to be used for the election of people to Congress. There was a long history of multi-member districts. Uh, and I think, I want to say Hawaii and New Mexico were the last two that, that did it. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. But uh, I think that that is, uh, any sort of districting is going to involve gerrymandering of some sort. Uh, it, it might not be as blatant as what we see here in Virginia or other states where the 5th Congressional District stretches from the border, the, the southern border of Loudoun County and Falk, uh, where it hits Fauquier County, stretches from there all the way down to the North Carolina border. Uh, but, uh, uh, but what we really do need is some sort of proportional representation. I agree with uh, Diane Blay on that, uh, to allow more than Republicans and Democrats to be electable to broaden our political debate in this nation, which is badly needed. And, uh, and I think that that is really how we should go here. I think the federal government should get out of the way and remove prohibitions from deciding how the states uh, want to elect their members to Congress. But then I would like to see the states move toward uh, some sort of uh, proportional representation for their own legislatures and for the uh, U.S. Uh, Congress. Ms. Blay. Well, of course, I am Ideally, we would like multi-member districts because that way we can have proportional representation. It means people like, like the independents would be able to actually have somebody hopefully representing them, and the liber there would be liber there would be more people. There would be a broader variety of candidates in the in the house. But until that time, of course, I think it's very necessary to have. This, there is a bill in Congress right now to do this, and I think it should be. It should, we should need uh, nonpartisan commissions to to ensure not that there isn't gerrymandering. So I would like to see that passed right now, and then hopefully multi districts later. I call. Thank you. Did, did you lose the question? I wanted to read it how it was. First of all, I'd like to thank whoever teed me up for this one, because if you were listening when I first started talking, this is one of my big issues. But if I, if I remember the question correctly, I would say no, I would not support a bill that called for bipartisan commissions to figure out the, figure out the congressional districts. I would support a constitutional amendment that would require nonpartisan uh, people commissions to select the, select the uh, congressional districts it's it's quote unquote bipartisan right now because our state legislatures are the ones who do it so they get together and they say oh well Virginia is currently eight Republicans and three Democrats so we want to make sure that it stays that way so here's how we're going to carve up the districts in order to make it stay eight three so that is quote unquote bipartisan because it has to pass through the state legislature. If you're unlucky enough to have your state legislature be controlled by one party, then yes, they have more of a say, but it is in essence that way right now. We can't trust either of the two parties even together to do what's right because they look at it like, oh, well, if we, if we get one over on them now, then they're going to do the same to us next time. So they just come together and it's it's how it's always been and and that has to end so we need a constitutional amendment and it needs to say that nonpartisan groups are going to be the ones who draw the district so that they are drawn only based on population and have no nothing to do with who lives in the district whether it's republicans or democrats who live in the district thank you all right i lost the question 
disappeared into thin air. I have no idea what happened to it. Um, now we're going to shift to nutrition. Nutrition. How are we doing, Jim? All right? Good? Okay. Um, with an overwhelming majority, um, one out of 24 bags of food assistance coming from churches and charitable organizations, and the other 23 provided by federal nutrition programs, given this disparity, do you agree that the federal food safety net is a necessity and not an option and should not be decreased? Ms. Blake. I stated before, I'm not in favor of having to rely on churches. I don't think that, I think it's great when churches want to do something, but to rely upon that to feed our people is terrible. So I, I would like um, a minimum income, a certain standard of living for everyone so that they don't have to rely upon a church to get to be fed. Um, and that is, that is what the Green Party says, a minimum standard of living for everyone particularly families, disabled people. Mr. Redpath. Oh, I'm not, okay. That's okay. I'll step up here and speak for the food programs before Bill slaps them down. Um, I think one in five children lives in poverty. And if we aren't doing absolutely everything we can to try to feed our children, then we are not doing our job. And, and we, I'll say right now, Congress, but I mean everybody. We look at, there are people in this country who look at the poor like they all got themselves into this position, that they're all drug addicts who can't hold a job and, and are just living off of the government. That is not the case. It is not the case in every situation. You cannot say that you know what's going on in that family and why they are in that situation. And to me, it doesn't matter. If someone is too poor to eat, then we should feed them. And yes, it's the federal government's responsibility to make sure our people aren't starving. I think we cut back on the food and nutrition program, and I, I thought that was just terrible. In my opinion, we should be spending more money on that. I talked about being a flat tax person. The reason I'm a flat tax person is because I think we should be collecting our taxes fairly so everybody pays the same percentage of their income and we collect the taxes fairly. You get rid of all the credits and deductions so we all know exactly what everybody else is paying. And I know you don't disagree with me. You disagree with me. We had a long conversation about this. But at any rate, but once we start collecting the taxes fairly, then we can decide what we want to spend the money on, and feeding our people could not be higher on the list. Thank you. Well, I agree it's very important, but, but you know, where does all this stuff come from? Okay? I, I, I want people to have food. I think that, that, that it should be administered by state and local governments. They are closer to the people. People at state and local governments are just as competent and just as kind-hearted as people working for the federal government. Uh, why are we spending? Why are we sending all our money to Washington, where they take a cut for administration cost and then send it back to the states? There is no need for that. So I, you know, look. Sorry, I, I, I've said to people, look, if goods and services grew up out of the ground like grass and weeds, I'd be a liberal too. But they don't. They have to come from somewhere. We are already running a budget deficit of over $500 million, 500 billion, I wish it were 500 million, 500 billion dollars a year. We've had deficits, <laughs> we've had deficits larger than, the, than, than the, the federal government budget when I started my career 34 years ago. It's out of control. If it's not brought under control, we're all going to be poor. All of us. You know, I, I, I hate, I, I don't mean to be a Scrooge here, but there has to be some sobriety in this discussion about how to provide necessities, and it is a necessity, but everybody seems to be running, oh, let's get the federal government involved in this, and any sort of need. We gotta call the federal government enough. It's bankrupting this country. Thank you. Okay. Would you support the TPP, why and why not? Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. And 
The Green Party is against NAFTA and GATT and TPP. They've, they think that there are so many problems with them and it's actually caused problems abroad. But personally, I, I don't, I've tried to understand these things and it's, it's tough, okay? So I, I, I rely upon, we have, uh, the Green Party has an expert and she's adamantly against the TPP and I think she knows what she's talking about and I've heard her. So, um, I, so anyway, that's, was that just it what, about the TPP? That was the only question? But let me respond real quick to William Redpath about the budget. If we cut our defense majorly, we would have money for people here and that's what we need and that's where we would find we could feed people if they absolutely need it and of course we want them to work and have jobs but if they don't we need to feed them so that's Mr. Redpath I'm certainly for the TPP uh, the intransigence and in not reaching an agreement with Trans-Pacific uh, partnership, I believe, is the last P. Yes, Trans-Pacific Partnership. The intransigence is more on the side of the United States in not reaching an agreement than Japan. But I would go further. First of all, I am for everything Diane Play just said she was against. I'm for NAFTA. It's been a tremendous thing for this nation and for Mexico as well. Uh, I'm certainly I'm for free trade. Not only am I in favor of these agreements, I think the United States should set an example for the world by unilaterally dropping all tariffs and trade barriers. That would set a tremendous example for the world. There is nothing more important for international peace than free trade, nothing. And, and we would set an example for all other nations of the world. And it is also a pro-consumer policy. It's a pro-consumer policy and that should be our goal. Why? Because we're all consumers. We're all consumers in this nation. Beyond that, then we have different jobs, different interests, and, and uh, things get uh, uh, complicated after that. But we need to, a pro-consumer trade policy that, that, that favors peace through international trade, unilateral disarmament in the trade war really does make sense for us and the United States should do it. You know, listening today, you would think Bill and I disagree on everything, but in fact, we talked before, and it's really not the case, and it just so happens you guys have brought up the right questions, I guess. Um, I, do, I do agree more with Bill on this one. I, I do believe in free trade and fair trade. Um, I also would agree on, on unilaterally uh, taking away tariffs. That would be, I think, a great thing. I would think subsidies as well. The federal government spends way too much money on subsidies, um, so I would be for getting rid of those as well. And I honestly, I don't know specifically enough about the T T TPP. I'll, I'll just say that right now. I would have to look more into that to give an, a specific answer on that issue. Uh, but in general, I do support free trade. So thank you. Thank you very much. And the last question we'll take before Jim takes his break, and we have a little break of our own, it deals with long-term care. Uh, the private insurance market has failed to meet the need for long-term care services for the infirm, elderly, and disabled. It is only 7% of the financing for long-term care. Medicaid has become the long-term care safety net for the middle class. Is there a better way? Mr. Redford. Yes, encouraging people through a pro uh, savings and investment tax code like the flat tax to encourage growth in the economy. The best way to address this problem is through economic growth and improve productivity and that will happen through more investment in this nation which would come about through allowing first of all the Cato 6.2 percent plan I mean in Chile they the, the the average worker in Chile has been re, re, has retired a millionaire there and 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 they have workers when given the chance to move out of the state-run system to a private investment system in Chile they have flocked to it but the land of the free can't have such a system come on we can have such a system and, and that would allow people to invest their entire lives, uh, to have property rights in their savings, and to lead toward a more affluent retirement. Uh, this is best addressed through, uh, as I said, uh, a pro savings and investment plan, Cato 6.2% plan. Economic growth is, is the key to bringing prosperity to all, including uh, the elderly. Strike Holt. Uh, 
alas, I'm going to have to concede on this one as well. I, I don't know what the answer is. I'm just going to tell you that right now, and and that's going to you're going to find that with me. If you're going to ask me a question, I don't speak in talking points, so I don't have the answer that's just ready to go. If I don't know the answer, I'm going to tell you I don't know the answer. My unfortunately, my my wife would probably be able to answer this question better as she sells long-term care, but. If, if we are leaning too heavy on Medicaid, then that is an issue. And I am sure that there are experts out there who would tell us what the better way is. And I would have to listen to their advice and make a decision based on that. I, I don't know what the answer is right now. Thank you. I'm actually confused about the question. <laughs> so. Yes. The private insurance market has failed to meet the need for long-term care services for the infirm, elderly, and disabled in only 7% of the financing of long-term care. Medicaid has become the long-term care safety net for the middle class. Is there a better way? Um, well, that, that is a very interesting question. Um, I didn't think Medicaid had become long-term insurance for the middle class, so I, I actually don't agree with that question. So. All right. Anybody in the frame of mind to do an oral question? Yes, please. Yeah, I, I was wondering where you all stand on the minimum wage. Um, I may see lots of times on the TV pundits talking about how we're all subsidizing the Walmart employees with food stamps because they're not being paid enough to get poor to feed themselves properly. And that's a very profitable company who, in fact, could afford to pay minimum wage. Okay. Mr. Eichholz, start with you. I'm a little split on the minimum wage. I think to, to blanketly say that every person who works should make $15 an hour or $10.10 an hour, sorry, it's 15 in Seattle, they raised it up to that. Um, I don't think that I, I don't think the federal government saying that there, that's the minimum is necessarily correct. I do believe it causes some unintended consequences. I think if somebody, that being said, if somebody is working forty hours a week for the entire year, then they should be able to make a living that puts them above the poverty wage, but. The difference between ten dollars and ten cents an hour in Alabama, or ten dollars and ten cents an hour in Northern Virginia, is wildly different. Uh, you, it, so it's really hard for the federal government to say, "Here's one wage, and everybody across the United States should make it," because it's hard to pick what that number is. If if there's a number. If, if it's so low that people are, you know, living in abject poverty because that's the only job that they can find, then, you know, we do have a problem. I'm not sure where that number is. It's, it's hard to have an honest discussion about it because you're going to get the 435 small business owners who are in the House of Representatives saying that it negatively affects small business and they're going to have to fire people and they're not going to be able to make any money. So it is difficult to have an honest discussion and really find out where that line is in order to try to help the most people. I, I think in general a blanket number for the entire country isn't going to work though. It would have to be somehow related to the cost of living and where you live. Thank you. Ms. Blay? Well, we are adamantly in favor of a, a minimum wage of, of $10 or more per hour. And um, regarding Walmart, it's it is true. The taxpayers are subsidizing the employees where they they need to get food stamps, they need other ways because they don't have it's not a livable wage. That is what we want for all. And that is so low. And as for determining what it is, I mean, $10 an hour, come on. And anywhere in the United States, it needs to be that level. So, I mean, that should be at least that. And um, probably $15 in lots of places, but 
the, the Congress should set a minimum wage of at least $10. So it's comparable to what we had in the 60s. Now we have people who are just trying to hold on by their skin to whatever in it. And these super rich have all this money. And um, like the Koch brothers have just increased and increased their wealth like $80 billion in the past few years. So it's just, there's a whole income inequality in the United States that is growing more and more worse. And we've got it. We've got to try to do something about it. Uh, minimum wage legislation is feel-good legislation that unfortunately harms the people that it is supposed to help. Uh, it is a single digit percentage of minimum wage earners who are heads of households. It's a single digit. It's mainly young people, people with low skills, uh, things of that nature. Uh, yeah, I just read recently, although it is an exception, but there is a place in North Dakota right now where Walmart is paying $17 an hour to their employees. Uh, I realize that is an exception, uh, but I uh, am in favor of a free market. It, it, if you look, uh, again, I'll re reference this report, um, Economic Freedom of the World, uh, that uh, this, uh, the freest nations, if you divide the nations of the world into quartiles, the most economically free, second uh, quartile, um, uh, third quartile, fourth quartile, the per capita income is like this. One, two, three, four. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to any minimum wage, frankly, and uh, I think it, it distorts the economy and it harms the people it's meant to help. Thank you. Next question. If you were President of the United States on 9-11 when the World Trade Center was attacked, how would you have responded? I guess I wouldn't have told people to go shopping. <laughs> but um, but um, I, I think the whole United States got a little phobic about our it, the it, fear level increased dramatically afterwards, and I think it's been to the detriment of our society so much that we have all this fear now about everything. And the, and I, I think we need to be aware and we need to be knowledgeable. But to think, to think that people were so shocked that this would happen, it always was a possibility. It always will be a possibility. Nuclear war, the the fact we have so many nuclear weapons out, it's a huge concern. Actually, that's more of a concern to me than this. So um, we just have to keep on going. I, I don't think we should change anything. We shouldn't have changed anything particular, particularly afterwards. Repair. I would have gone to the Congress and asked for a declaration of war on Al Qaeda, which would have been granted under the circumstances, uh, most assuredly. And I would have attacked. Al Qaeda, based on that declaration in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, would have it would have been a relatively quick operation. I would not have participated in any sort of nation building, which we've now been doing in Afghanistan for 13 years. Uh, it has been a quagmire for us, the longest war in this nation's history. But the initial response, I think, uh, of, of attacking Al Qaeda in Afghanistan was certainly warranted and. Uh, and, and so I think that is what I would have done. But I would have done it uh, because the, that the, the damage had already been done. Uh, I would have asked for a declaration of war on Al-Qaeda from the U.S. Congress. Mr. Eichel. I think I have to disagree with Bill again on this one. Again. Violence only begets violence. We were attacked by a group of people who hate us. And, and they attacked us and killed 3,000 of our citizens. So our response is to respond in kind. This is what they live for. And somebody should explain it to our friends in Israel. You, you get bombed once, so you kill... 2,000 civilians and then you perpetuate the cycle one more time around. I w of course would have wanted to do what we could to get rid of Al-Qaeda. I'm not sure that invading another country was the answer. 
it sounds good to say that we would have gone in and just got rid of Al Qaeda and then I guess left the Taliban or if we're going to get rid of the Taliban also then we'll just leave a complete power vacuum in the country and not try to build the country back up but there are consequences to invading another country and we continue to live through that and then we did it again in Iraq and I know that's unrelated President George W. Bush they were completely unrelated but I'm not a person who thinks that our first response should be violence. If we are atta- even if we are attacked, it, where is the turn the other cheek? I think we are, we are, we say we are a Christian people. We say we want to be the beacon on the hill, but our response is somebody attacks me. I'm the biggest kid on the block. Somebody attacks me, so I'm gonna go smack them all down. Well, that is not being the bigger person or the bigger country that's not leading this this world so i thought it was wrong thank you thank you next question would you introduce and support a bill to make voting easier such as no excuse absentee voting uh, if not why not and i guess if so why so I think that's a state issue, not a federal issue. So I would not, I think there should be a right to vote in the U.S. Constitution. There is not a right to vote in the U.S. Constitution, and I think there there should be. It is a very important, precious right we have that obviously people have died for. Uh, so uh, so that is, is very important. Um, I would say that, that there has to be, voting should be as easy as possible, but it also has to have integrity. For instance, I think there are potential problems, say, where somebody registers to vote by mail and then proceeds to vote by mail. Uh, Nobody shows up anywhere in that process, and I think that that we have to to consult election experts uh, and have an election system with integrity uh, where we can trust the results, and, and perhaps even the results could be verifiable. Uh, but uh, after beyond that, then we should make voting as easy as possible. Uh, but uh, I would not uh, institute federal mandates uh, to the states uh, on this. Um, I do agree with Bill on this one. I think we should make it as easy as possible for people to vote, but uh, it has to be a system that has integrity. I I agree with what he said. Um, I would say I think that election day should be a national holiday if so we can make it just as easy as possible for everyone to get out and vote not just people who can make it to the polls when they're open. I think we if if we're gonna vote during the day then it should be a holiday and we should be encouraging people to get out and vote as much as possible. Thank you. Okay, I need to, I need this repeated again. Is it? Would you? Would you introduce introduce or support a bill to make voting easier, such as no excuse absentee voting? If not, why not? If so, why so? Yes, I would like voting to be as easy easy as possible, um, and the Voting Rights Act amendment is is. Um, is a way to make sure that everyone can vote, and that's that's um, it's been in the Congress since, since January to twenty for almost a year now, I guess. And so, theoretically, many people aren't able to vote because they uh, the state does passes a law, and yet it and they and because there isn't preclearance sent to the Justice Department anymore, there's no federal oversight. So the Voting Rights Act Amendment would be a way to get this federal oversight needed so more people could vote, and it should be as easy as possible. Thank you. Do you support the Pentagon's plan to cut the active duty army to between 440 and 450,000 soldiers, which would reduce the force to its smallest size since before World War II? Mr. Eichel. I had not heard that plan. I absolutely support it 100%. I think our current 
military is at 1.4 million active duty troops. I do think that's way too many. I think our defense currently takes up 20% of the federal budget. So you add that to entitlements and we're and the the interest on our debt and we're up to 70% of our federal budget right there. If you aren't going to talk about those items, then having a discussion about balancing the budget is just it's just games. It's just gamesmanship. So I do believe that our military is way too big. I think it's part of the reason that we get into these conflicts throughout the world because the commander in chief has control of the largest army in the world and when anything pops up that he doesn't like, oh, well I have this military here that can do whatever I want whenever I want. I think we do need to back it down. It should be more about defense and less about aggressive action across the world. Thank you. Ms. Blay. I'll be happy to repeat the question. I didn't lose this one. Here we go. Do you support the Pentagon's plan to cut the active duty army to between 440,000 to 450,000 soldiers, which would reduce the force to its smallest size since before World War II? Well, yes, of course. I think that we need to drastically change, uh, to lower the cost of the, the budget for our military is now over half of the federal budget, and it's it's as much as it was almost during World War II. So it's we've got to do major changes to that. So um, that sounds like a good starting point. Well, I, actually, I, I, I thought the military was more on the order of about 20% of the entire budget. I mean, maybe you're talking discretionary. Well, I think the, the entire budget is like 3.6 uh, trillion dollars, and uh, the Pentagon budget right now, I think, is in the ballpark of high 500, 600 billion dollars, uh, but uh, there's plenty to cut there. The answer is yes. Uh, I, uh, first of all, 43% of all of the world's military spending is done by the United States. Our wealthy allies are not carrying their fair share of the defense spending load. They are free riding and have been for a long time on the United States. Diane is absolutely right that defense spending can be cut it should be cut, but we need a vision of a more restrained foreign policy, a less adventurous foreign policy, such as, again, running into another war in the, in the Middle East, which we're, it looks like we're hell-bent on doing right now. Uh, there is a book that came out recently by an academic who's a, an expert on defense issues. His name is Barry Posen, and his uh, P-O-S-E-N, uh, the book is called Restraint, is the title of it. And he proposes that uh, a uh, percentage of gross domestic product of 2.5% is plenty to uh, have our armed forces defend the United States and the people and property in it. Uh, our current GDP is about $16.8 trillion times 2.5% would be about $420 billion a year for the Department of Defense. I think that would be plenty to uh, effectively defend this nation and, as I said, the people and property in it. Uh, but it will require a more restrained foreign policy, uh, which we badly need. I don't think the format allows for that. I apologize. I got to follow rules too. You know, it's kind of a. Um, we are going nowhere on immigration reform, but all seem to agree that something needs to be done. What do you see as the basic principles that need to be affirmed in any policy that is adopted? Ms. Blake. Well, basically, unless there's some major reason that someone can't be admitted into our country, they need to have an available a way to become a citizen. So that's so amnesty for all, if possible, unless there's a reason they can't have it. Okay, I'll say it really quickly. So Bill is correct about uh, the amount we spend. Uh, also, I would just like to add that the U.S. spends more than the next 13 countries combined on defense. The next 13 countries combined, that's how much we spend on defense, on our military. And the NATO, NATO is trying to get all of its members to spend 2% 
on of their of their GDP on defense. Currently, England is the only one who meets that standard at a shade over two percent, and the U.S. spends like four point three percent or somewhere around that number. Forgive me if I'm wrong. Immigration. Let's start with number one. I think we need to look at the people who are trying to come into our country as people and not some type of scourge that is being brought upon our country. We, they are coming here because we are the beacon of the world. They're coming here because they want a better life. They're fleeing abject poverty and, and, uh, and violence in their countries and so we should do what we can to help them I think that being said it's a three-part problem we do need to secure our borders and make sure that people aren't just streaming into the country that there is some type of some type of guarding against you know random people coming in so that we can make sure it, we are secure because we don't want terrorists just streaming across the border. We have to deal with the 17 million people, I think, who are here now illegally. I think there should be a path to citizenship that if they meet certain requirements like paying a fine, paying their back taxes, and meeting a security check, there should be a path to citizenship for them. And I'm running out of time, so I'll get to the third one later. Thank you. Uh, yes, the Libertarian Party is uh, definitely pro-immigration. I think that we ought to have an open but regulated system. It's just not just anybody across the border anytime they want, no. But uh, I do think that, that it, it should be open, but we should make sure that people coming into this nation do not have a serious communicable disease, do not have a criminal background, and cannot reasonably be deemed a security threat. And if they pass those criteria, then they ought to be able to immigrate to the United States, uh, get a work visa. That's the most important thing, is to bring people out of the shadow economy, uh, give them uh, legal protections uh, it, to be here, and uh, with a path to citizenship. Uh, I, we are absolutely in need of immigrants in the future. They, they have benefited this economy so greatly over the centuries, frankly. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to need more of them in the future with an aging population. Uh, if, if we want to pay out these entitlements that the American people seem to want, uh, we definitely need uh, some, some more youth uh, in this nation, and immigration would be a great way to bring that uh, forward. Uh, but it's the right thing to do. These are people, too. And, uh, and, and a lot of people seem to think, oh, tell them to go get in line. Well, you know what? There is no line for uh, Mexicans, who have low skills and don't have a family connection in the United States, there is no line. It's impossible to legally immigrate. People in the Philippines right now, uh, I've been told, with family in the United States, a familial connection, the wait time to legally immigrate is 25 years. I mean, there, you, you can't ask people to go, and, and, and that's, that's the only way we're going to secure the borders, is by having an open but regulated process. So people are incentivized to come into the country through the right and legal way. Thank you. Um, what parameters or restrictions should there be for the use of surveillance drones? considering privacy, Mr. Eichel. <laughs> I don't think we should use surveillance drones within the United States. I, I think it's a mistake. I'm not a slippery slope argument kind of a person, but go ask someone who lives in Pakistan what it's like to have drones hovering over your head 24-7, 365 days a year. They live in terror in Pakistan of the sky, blue skies. They say in, in Pakistan, they like when there's gray skies because the drones don't fly over there when, when the skies are gray. So we've made the blue sky now something that people fear. And yes, that's in Pakistan. But obviously we cannot use restraint when it comes to items like this look around our country you give people 
you you give localities armor and and weapons of war and they use them because they are not trained well enough to use them who is going to restrain a locality who's using a a, a drone to spy on the people there's no other way to put it than that there's there's other ways we've been getting along for a long time without using drones to look in on on our own people and i don't think we should start doing that now thank you i i haven't having just heard this question i really <laughs> like to think this through for a while but I the whole concept makes me pretty queasy but but I assume that first of all implicit in the question is use of drones by government not use of drones by uh, private uh, companies or private entities or individuals uh, but I would say that you'd, you'd have to execute a search warrant I mean it to me that would be a minimum through some legal process that the government would uh, would have to have a legally uh, uh, executed search warrant to do any sort of observation by drone and even then I'm not I'm not sure about that but I can see in some instances where uh, it, it might you might want that I mean they send robots into places now for law enforcement where they don't want to send a human being so I, I could see there might be some uh, circumstances where it would be advisable uh, but uh, only with a, uh, a warrant and and I would want to be very fastidious and uh, stingy uh, with the use of drones as a policy in this nation, that's for sure. Okay, well, <clears throat> there are different kinds of drones. I think Amazon, it's great that they're going to be able to deliver packages as, and so quickly. Um, but, um, and, but the killer drones are what it's, is terrible. I mean, in Pakistan, they're, they're afraid of killer drones. They're not just surveillance, they are killers. And so what we're, when we use the term surveillance drones, that means for the United States, and I agree that there should be um, something done, a pre-security pre thing to make sure it's valid thing to do. Um, and, um, and we need to, again, like so many things, we need to watch out to see where we, the cyber security and so many things that we want to watch out so that so the government isn't doesn't infringe on our rights. Thank you. We're down to our last group of questions. They've been very good. You should be commended as an audience for the diversity of the topics that you have chosen. On that same token, what type of campaign finance reform do you support, Mr. Redpen? I, I favor an open system. Uh, I think that, that we ought to do away with uh, campaign finance restrictions. I think disclosure is, uh, is, uh, is certainly uh, okay, and even disclosure at times has been abused uh, by people who've uh, given to unpopular causes and then have been harassed or uh, fired. There was one executive, I forget which uh, company it was, where he was basically dismissed because he gave money to the wrong side of a proposition on gay marriage in uh, California. Uh, so even disclosure is not uh, completely benign. But uh, I, I think that the uh, campaign finance restrictions are basically an incumbent's racket. I think that, that uh, you have a situation where, I, I remember the story of Eugene McCarthy, his insurgent campaign for president in 1968. Uh, he said that uh, in today's, with today's campaign finance laws, that whole campaign would have been dead on arrival. It never would have occurred if he couldn't have called upon three wealthy backers who bankrolled his presidential campaign, helped lead to Lyndon Johnson not running for president in 1968 for re-election, uh, may have helped uh, bring about uh, uh, an end to the Vietnam War, although it took way too long for that to occur, that's for sure. So I, I, I think that uh, uh, we, ought, we ought to have a more open system that allows uh, challengers uh, uh, and, and the, the non-wealthy uh, to be able to get large contributions to finance campaigns that people want to finance. Ms. Blake? Well, campaign financing, financing of campaigns by corporate corporations has led to this insidious partnership between the government, 
between pol politicians and um, corporations. And so we have, um, we total, the Green Party advocates total um, responsible um, funding of political campaigns. We need to have them shorter. We need, there need to be lots of things, but um, we certainly, the way that we have these campaigns run now is travesty. People, it's, they're like bribes, and people, and our Congress people, just the politicians, react, and whether they they think they are or not, they think they're not uh, accepting bribes. That they they can take all this money and not have it affect them. But I know subconsciously it does, and so there, therefore it has affected our whole economy and our agricultural programs and, and um, the corn products all, it has ramifications throughout the whole system that I think are terrible. I think we should have publicly funded campaigns. I think we should get rid of all private contributions to campaigns. If it is not impropriety, it is the appearance of impropriety, and the people who run our country should be above that. I can't accept a gift. I work at Northrop Grumman of more than $20 because of the appearance of impropriety for my company. And that is just one company, and I know that lots of companies are that way, and yet we are allowing the people who write the laws of our country to be given millions of dollars and yes it goes towards their campaign but they're they're politicians there are 435 politicians in the house of representatives right now and every one of them has one goal to get re-elected the next time until they retire because as you all know if even if they didn't come in to politics as a millionaire many of them leave that way they utilize their position for their own benefit and part of keeping that position is continuously collecting money for the next election. They don't get things done. They don't get immigration reform done. They don't get any of these other items done because they would rather argue about the issue because it helps them raise more money. Their only thought is to raise more money and win their next election. It can't be that way anymore. I think we should have a constitutional amendment and have Fund, publicly funded campaigns, set a dollar amount on how much you're allowed to spend. And if you don't, if you want to go out, go out and meet the people. Go out and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. That's how I'm going to win this campaign, is going out and meet people individually and talk to them and tell them what my views are. That's how, we, that's how our elected officials should be selected, not by who can collect the most money and try to buy votes. They don't see it any other way. There's actually a dollar amount that they say it's five or ten dollars a vote. You spend that, and that's what you get. That we can't allow that to continue. Thank you. Last question. I'm tempted to say who are, whoever wants to do this one first, but this this may be a loaded question. So after you hear it, what would you do to increase the number of women serving in public office? Ms. <laughs> Um, I, I think the United States is on the right track in that we're trying to get women to serve, but unfortunately, again, we only have like 15% of, of the of Congress is is actually 15% at many levels uh, of government. The women are taking well, actually, net federal at local levels, it's much higher that women there are more women, but um, federal, it is about 15% and has been that way for a long time. It's hard to get. It's hard to get women to run for office. I think sometimes, and there are many organizations that try. But um, I think if we just keep at it, it will happen. And I know AAUW, which I'm a proud member of, has programs to get women to run, and um, and other organizations do too. Well, I would be curious to find out why it is that women don't run and so I, I don't I don't want to be sexist in any way and try to try to say I know why women don't run for office I do think we need more candidates I think the way to that is to 
through campaign finance reform. That's one of the ways I think the system is really ugly right now. I mean, who wants to put themselves through this? You tell somebody you're running for office and they say, wow, congratulations, that's going to be a slog. And, and if you get close to winning, the two party machines are going to come and try to tear you down. And so you either have to be a perfect person or be willing to accept having all of your flaws put out for everyone to see. Who wants to go through that? We have to take the government back away from the extremes of either party. We have to tell the John Faust of the world that the way they're running their campaign is the reason why 20% of people in a recent poll couldn't even bring themselves to say they were going to vote for one of them too. Because it's, and, and they don't get it. They don't get it. They see the 20% of people who didn't respond and they say, hmm, that's odd this late in election that, you know, 20% of people wouldn't even pick a side. It's because the way you run your campaign. Nobody wants a super conservative and nobody wants a person who's going to run their campaign the way Mr. Faust is running his campaign. It's ugly, it's gross, and we need to fix the whole system. And when we fix the whole system, I would imagine more women would put themselves up to try to run for office. Thank you. Nations around the world that have proportional representation have more women in their legislatures. That's a fact. And I am treasurer of an organization called Fair Vote. Uh, its website is fairvote.org. And I urge you, don't listen to my ideas, ask somebody who really knows what they're talking about or go to our website, fairvote.org. Uh, go to Representation 2020. It is a project of Fair Vote uh, that talks about trying to increase the uh, percentage of legislatures, uh, legislative seats occupied by women. And I think some change uh, to multi-member districts and proportional representation uh, would be the best way to uh, increase uh, uh, women, the number of women legislators uh, in the United States. So again, that's fairvote.org, representation 2020. Please join me in thanking Mr. Eicholt, Ms. Blay, and Mr. Redpath for participating in tonight's debate. Meet and greet, sorry, meet and greet. <laughs>